Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar discussion this afternoon of A Philosopher's Economist, Human the Rise of Capitalism, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2020. I'm Lisa Tiersen, I'm Professor of History and Chair of the Department at Barnard and I'll be moderating our webinar. And I'd like to start us off by introducing our authors and speakers if they wanna put on their video and, and that would be great, thanks. So first our authors, Margaret Chabis is Professor of Philosophy at the University of British Columbia and the author of A World Ruled by Number and the Natural Origins of Economics. With Carl Wetterlin, she previously co-edited David Hume's Political Economy. And Carl Wetterlin is Professor of History at Barnard College, Columbia University, and the author of Casualties of Credit, The English Financial Revolution, 1620 to 1720. He co-edited co -edited David Hume's Political Economy with Margaret Chabis. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers, Emma Rothschild, Ms. Moore, Collegiate Professor, I'm sorry, that was Victoria de Gracia. Emma Rothschild, sorry, is Jeremy and James Knowles, Professor of History at Harvard University, Honorary Professor of History and Economics at the University of Cambridge, and a Fellow of Magdalen College, Cambridge. She is the author of, among other works, Paradise Lost, The Decline of the Auto-Industrial Age, and The Inner Life of Empires in 18th Century History. Victoria de Gracia is Moore Collegiate Professor of History at Columbia University, and she is the author of, among other works, The Perfect Fascist, A Story of Love, Power, and Morality, which just came out last fall, and the forthcoming Soft Power Internationalism 1990 to 2020 with Borja Beiklert. Turku Isiksel is Associate Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, and her research has appeared in Human Rights Quarterly, the European Journal of International Law, International Journal of Constitutional Law, Global Constitutionalism, the European Law Journal, and Constellations. So the format of the webinar will be as follows. Our authors are going to introduce the book and we'll then hear from each of our speakers. After that, the authors will have a chance to respond to their remarks. And finally, after the panelists have spoken, we will have some time for questions from the audience and you'll see a Q&A box on your screen where you'll be able to submit your questions to me and I'll then read them out loud. So without further ado. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, before we begin, on behalf of Margaret and myself, I would like to genuinely thank Professors Rothschild, Sixel, De Gracia, and, and Tiersten for participating today. We also wanna thank the European Institute and the Heyman Centers, Eileen Gilulu, Kei Zheng, Kelly McKinney for making all the arrangements. And we're also deeply grateful for all of our colleagues and our friends who we know have showed up today, although we can't see you. Uh, so let me address the, 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 the question of why we wrote this book at this point in time. There are at least three reasons for this. The first and most obvious is that we had each been working on Hume for at least two decades, and we found it frustrating that no one had written a monograph in English that properly treated Hume's economics and how it's situated in his broader philosophical, historical, and political project. So we decided to change that. The second rationale was to bring Hume's deeply philosophical approach to economics to the attention of contemporary economists. After the 2008 financial crisis, there was some optimism that neoclassical economics would move, uh, move on from its prevailing ahistorical, aethical, and apolitical approach. Given that Hume offers an example of an economics that is rigorously grounded in epistemology, metaphysics, political philosophy, ethics, and history, we thought our book might be of utility to economists as they pursue new avenues. The third reason for writing this book at the moment when the history of capitalism was gaining traction was to fully capture Hume's analysis of the conditions and mechanisms that have to be in place for capitalism to generate not just economic benefits, but social, moral, and political refinement. Hume's rather rosy view of capitalism can either be viewed and re read as triumphalism or we can read it as a taxonomy that we can use to judge the extent of our achievements and failures over the last two centuries. As we say in the book, Hume was a bit of an economic materialist. He believed that our happiness was proportional to degree of economic prosperity. He did not argue that there was a simple causal link between consumption and happiness, Although Le Bon David, as he was known in the French salons, was notoriously delighted by a sumptuous table. Capitalism, he argued, generates a greater quality of life primarily because it fosters the refinement of social virtues. 
such as sociability, honesty, benevolence, and friendship. Wealth and virtue were thus not mutually exclusive for Hume. But Hume did not believe in the natural sociability of people. Instead, he found people in general rather lacking in generosity towards strangers. To form societies, people had to find a way to restrain their avarice so that the respect for property, exchange, and money could be upheld. Hume suggested that these institutions emerge organically from a slight redirection of people's selfishness. A person realizes through trial and error that it is in her long-term best interest to respect the commercial institutions because in the long run, she will be able to benefit from them herself. These institutions mediate the interactions between selfish people in a way that upholds justice and social peace, as well as promote behavior that had economic, social, political, and moral benefits. There were three practices in particular, industry, commerce, and the refinements of the arts and sciences that were responsible for polishing mores and softening people's tempers. Industry brought meaning and dignity to people's lives, lives, Hume argued. It also instilled a sense of discipline and purpose. It is, he said, a powerful means of reforming the mind and implanting in it good dispositions and inclinations. Participation in commerce further contributed to a person's sophistication. To successfully navigate the world of business required a wide variety of expertise, from penmanship and arithmetic to language proficiency and knowledge of foreign politics. It also promoted a cosmopolitan sensibility and a mutual respect between people. Honesty and probity were also essential characteristics of the successful merchants. Finally, those who had participated in the refinement of the arts and sciences, both the mechanical and the liberal arts, were constantly engaged in problem solving and used their brains creatively. Knowledge formation was thus not limited to one sphere of society, but spread like wildfire. The same age, he wrote, that produces great philosophers and politicians, renowned generals and poets, usually abounds with skillful weavers and ship carpenters. When society is enveloped by such a spirit of improvement, profound ignorance is totally banished and men cultivate the pleasures of the mind as well as those of the body. Together, these actions promoted a more polished and refined world. However, society would never reach any kind of perfection partly because there would always be some people who would fail to uphold property and partly and more uh, importantly, because all people in society did not have access to industry commerce in the arts. It was mostly the middling sorts. Hume thus concluded that while people in capitalism would never became perfectly virtuous, he believed that capitalism had the capacity to provide a more solid foundation for progressive, humane, and reasonable society than any religion or political theory. For Hume, capitalism and enlightenment were thus joined at the hip. Okay, it's my turn now to take over. So like most philosophers, Hume drove a wedge between appearance and reality. His grasp of the distinction between the nominal and the real in economics was to a large extent without precedent. He recognized that across Western Europe, there was a strong tendency toward uniform prices in a given region. And this was due primarily to the increased mobility of labor and capital, as well as the actions of middlemen to induce economies of scale. He also discerned that the price of basic goods like corn and cloth had come down in real terms notwithstanding ongoing inflation. So he really had a very profound command of these important um, tendencies. The primary reason for Hume was the falling rate of profit. High profit rates were characteristic of nascent capitalism, but in a mature capitalist country such as Britain, merchants and manufacturers were in stiff competition with one another and compelled, as he put it, to trade on small profits. Hume brilliantly argued that the profit rate and the interest rate converge or tend to converge. And the evident decline in the interest rate from a 10% ceiling under Elizabeth I to 3% in his own day was the best barometer of capitalist development. While many view the interest rate as a purely monetary phenomenon, as the price that cleared the market for loanable funds, Hume dug more deeply 
and discerned that the interest rate was not only a salient feature of the world, but grounded in human dispositions to abstinence, risk, and time. And Hume also grasped that with the spread of global trade and the rise of capitalism, money had acquired powers that were by and large transcendent of human agency. His specie flow mechanism identified a tendency for a global equilibrium in money in accordance with the balance of trade. And this trumped any measures by the crown, either to limit the export of bullion or to debase the currency. Hume celebrated monetization, the transition from a barter system to a commercial world. And he singled out the critical moment in the spread of money when, quote, no hand is empty of it. He endorsed the complex array of modern monetary instruments, particularly private banknotes, all of which he saw as increasing liquidity and thus facilitating capital accumulation and the spread of commerce and trade more generally. Significantly for Hume, under certain conditions, money had a brief power to magically stimulate economic growth by prompting weavers and farmers to work more intensively, to increase aggregate demand for finished goods and unleash the money multiplier. Hume's cosmopolitan vision of the migration of economic opportunity and his appeals to the gains of trade led him to issue a famous prayer for France to urge Britain to cultivate enlarged and benevolent sentiments towards its neighbors. By abandoning jealousies of trade, he believed the world could achieve, or at least this was the best hope, um, greater peace and prosperity. But not everything, as Carl mentioned, was rosy. For Hume, the darkest cloud on the horizon was prolonged warfare. And the fact that this resulted in a significant rise in the public debt, primarily through the issuance of bonds. Hume calculated that the cost of the British Navy and Army had risen significantly in real terms. And as a result, the public debt had more than doubled in the first half of the 18th century. If nothing was done to contain it, he feared that Britain would eventually be forced to declare itself bankrupt and decline into despotism. Hume believed that capitalism best flourished in small republics or constitutional monarchies such as his own, and that the burgeoning middle class of merchants and bankers was, quote, the best and firmest basis of public liberty. They were also at the vanguard of secular culture and thus seminal for Hume's lifelong project to lift the yoke of religious superstition and idolatry, and to avoid that unfortunate ocean of blood that had beset the first half of the 17th century. Hume's analysis of the political and ethical dimensions of capitalism, his penetrating understanding of human nature, and his historical sensibility are more than sufficient reason to read his work once more with a close eye. Thank you. believe that Emma Rothschild would go next. But you're on mute. You're, you need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, Hume wrote his political discourses a few years before the noun economist came to have anything close to its subsequent meaning or professional association. But it's plausible all the same to think of being an economist as David Hume's principal public identity over the course of much of the ensuing century. He was known mostly as, at least in the English speaking world, as Mr. Hume, the historian, but he was argued with as an economist. So Margaret's and Carl's book is immensely welcome. It really is one of the works which every library will have to have, and more, much more importantly, a work to be read and reread. And I've had the great pleasure of rereading it um, these past few days. And the, the, um, there are really two questions I'd like to pose and ask, encourage the authors to say something more about. One is suggested by the title, and it's to do with Hume and capitalism. Um, now, 
Hume was some a figure who was sort of fascinated by um, the, the the condition of being in two minds about something. This this um, this comes perhaps most vividly in the wonderful passage from the treatise when he's talking about being in the depths of philosophical darkness and he's restored by living and talking like other people in the common affairs of life. I quote, I dine, I play a game of backgammon, I converse and am merry with my friends. So he, I think throughout his life, he was thinking about sort of going from heaven across to hell and, and, and thinking of things from two different perspectives. Now, I think um, one of the many insights that emerges very clearly from Margaret St. Carl's book is the extent to which Hume was in two minds about um, the idyll of commerce on the one hand and the um, and the menace of of war, and its con con um, constituent national jealousy on the other hand, and I wonder if you might want to say a bit more about how you saw this this tension uh, um, emerging in in Hume's in Hume's writing. I, I mean, I, I I think there are many ways one could connect this tension to the, the sort of rise of capitalism question. One has to do with the industrial revolution and the role of, of what were called at the time warlike stores or the high technology of preparing for large scale war in the, the rise of capitalism. Another which relates to um, um, uh, Karl's earlier work has to do with credit and the extent to which the system of credit, both public and private, was related to war. And um, um, the third perhaps has to do with um, the, the question of the mobility that was associated with these enormous European and worldwide disruptions. And was that something that was positive for, um, for the, the rise of the modern economy? And, you know, it was extreme, it was very, kind of Lisa in introducing me to, to mention a book that I published 48 years ago, I calculated, but um, I, um, I have, I did publish a book about um, 14 days ago um, called An Infinite History, and that's about French history. But one of the things that emerged so clearly to me in this multi-generational history of a French family was the extent to which, in a sense, modernity was stimulated by the disruption of, of, of war, not only the French Revolution, but also, also of war going right through the early modern and, and period in the 19th century. So it's, it's something I've been very interested in for in a sense, seen from below. But I wondered, I, I'd be fascinated to hear what the authors um, um, see as the way the tension played out in um, the tension between commerce and war played out in, um, in, in Hume's thought. And the other question um, is, is actually in a way um, related. I'd, I'd, be, um, I'd be fascinated to hear you um, talk a bit more since to my delight, we are here under, in part under the auspices of the European Institute um, about David Hume as a European. Um, you, you, in the book, you describe this sort of amazing journey that he took in, in 1748 from a, a miserable port in, in, in Holland all the way down the Rhine and the, and the, um, and the Danube and, and, and sort of on bumpy boats ending up in Turin. But really throughout his personal and um, intellectual life, Hume was a profoundly European figure. I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, um, it, it's misleading in a way to think of him as so many economists do as a sort of Scottish, um, a, a Scottish philosopher or a Scottish 
empirical economist. And um, I mean, think of his own life. He, he, um, he wanted in the 1760s to settle in France and, and um, never go back to Edinburgh. And, and he, what he recounts is that he only decided against it because he was, um, he feared that when the next war broke out, he would be expelled from France because he'd had a, 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 a sort of public role in the British government. So I think this, this European identity was an enormously important part of the entire fascinating story that, that, that you tell in the book. And I'd love to hear more about how you see this part of, of, of Hume's life and thought. Thank you. Nikki. You can unmute me. I hope I am now. Thank you uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, my acquaintance with Hume, uh, with David Hume, uh, is superficial in a way, but in other ways deep. Uh, I uh, very much through our core curriculum where Hume used to, I think he's been excluded recently from the canon, used to figure in conversation with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, of course with Adam Smith, but actually recently more so when they began to introduce Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments as a philosopher, humanist as well as an economics, economist and, and with Immanuel Kant. And in that framework, I found him an appealing, if rather alien, maybe, maybe even a slightly weird figure. It, it, conversation clearly, uh, especially in the 1990s, had him as empiricist, very open, tolerant, non-judgmental in terms of ethical questions in a, in a rather superficial way, okay, about sexual behavior particularly. That was something which uh, was of interest to the students, diversity. Uh, and, you know, his, his openness, uh, especially when compared, if you want, to the rebarbative Kant and the downright uh, difficult, obnoxious Rousseau, and these were you know, part, of, part of teaching. But um, it was also clearly uh, in terms of methodology that uh, you know, it's, he seemed that the, you know, the man of the, of the Anglophone world, uh, talking about markets, talking about commerce, talking about um, ethics in a, an open but a fairly unproblematic way, whereas on the continent, uh, with Rousseau particularly, but with Kant, the problem of what lay behind morality, what lay behind uh, notions of property was, was a, a much more, if you want, evolved, but certainly posed in very, very different kinds of uh, ways. Uh, returning to him in the last few years, I found him even, even more sympathetic figure for his human qualities uh, his transparency, his curiosity, his equanimity. Uh, and I don't think, uh, not least between, for Adam Smith's description of his death, which you know, maybe because of my age or, or, or whatever, uh, struck me as, as just a remarkable, the way his, his death, the equanimity, knowing that he didn't know whether there was a God or not. And that I found also was very striking for the students to think of the sort of last moment. Okay, enough said on that. Uh, but in some ways, I've always been seeing him through uh, the lens of a continental. This comes perhaps to, uh, to refers to to Emma's question about him as a European. And even in the book, I was surprised to hear the Europeans call him Le Bon David, um, and sort of reminded me a little bit of what what were they saying when they said Le Bon David? Were they seeing him as a bon vivant? Were they seeing him somebody who really wanted to leave? Uh, 
a, a commercial crass commercialism of the British Isles uh, to uh, join them? Was there something of the Noel Coward, you know, uh, uh, which we used to say always about the, you know, the British, the, uh, in this now seeing them in, 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 in Italy where he never got very far to having just ended up in Turin, which was really quite French at that point, you know, this sort of mad dogs and Englishmen out in the noonday sun. That was, is there something particular about how he reasoned, how he, his affect, whatever, uh, which in some ways you do address in the book, because the book really is a, a, a piece now which I would embrace, which would help me much better to um, understand uh, uh, Hume were I to teach him again in the framework of thinking about uh, the continental theorists at the same time who are trying to get at what is a good society and what is the relationship to uh, you know, underlying morality and in uh, Rousseau's case, particularly the question of property. And that struck me as an important move uh, in, 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 in this way that we are at, a, at this point really, really reaching to understand different kinds of materialisms. It seems to be a moment where it, one doesn't just reread Karl Marx, but there's a big effort on the part uh, of uh, to, 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 to sort of reprise material, underlying materiality of society and to think of it in new ways. And this strikes me that this effort to bring back Hume into the conversation is very, very interesting. I can think too of work that are, are being done now, say on the Neapolitan physiocrats uh, who were also in communication uh, with, 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 with Hume, um, that they, they too come back and they seem much richer because they are so interested in society and the great range of things happening and how the economy both infuses them and is infused by them. And so the book, it really does set out with maximal clarity to, uh, engage in this and we should come back I hope at the at the end is to what what happened to economics in the last 50 years that it became so voided of society and history that we are now in the process of trying to bring back some of the classics and rethink them and rework them but, well what you do very extremely well is to provide this sort of holistic vision of economics as it's read through him. Uh, and I was particularly touched, and I guess these are where, the, where I also have the questions. The way that you uh, bring back and go through his, his method, um, his evidence, how he collected it, um, what, he, what, what was he reading, and your suggestion, though you can't perhaps know, uh, that he probably had access to perhaps 4,000 uh, works, uh, you know, and it wasn't sure if most of them were English or French, uh, whether, I, you know, it was hard for me to understand whether he would also know uh, other languages but, uh, beyond that, which was, which was very common at the time, presuming he had read uh, Latin, but then I wasn't sure of it. But what I was interested there, in, indeed, in this method, in this empirical method, is how far he could push himself, because this is a problem in how he understands moral conventions. He looks around the entire world, stacks up all the moral conventions, and then you know, begins to ask what's what, you know. Um, so particularly I was struck by how he used, let's say the example of China. You mentioned that uh, he, uh, there, there are maybe dozens of references uh, in order to you know, make his science universal. And yet I wasn't quite clear exactly what the boundaries are. In other words, how he brings in, and I don't mean just China, I mean China in the sense that some, some of the Adam Smith refers it to the other, the opposite, the way that, let's say, the Bourbon Kingdom of Naples, with his, all of its closures, with its jealousies of trade, the way Hume speaks of the, Vatic, of, of, of the papacy without really knowing that much about it as, a, as kind of must, it must be bounded, you know, given that it's despotic and Catholic uh, by jealousy of trade. So it's a question then about what, 
whether these re this wide referentiality ever causes him a kind of pause to think of, you know, what is the other, what are alternate ways? In other words, either genealogically or historically, because I didn't actually find how he, that he was historical as, let's say, as Adam Smith seems to be. But then again, we're, re I'm, we're reading here about him. The other question that I had, which is a very special interest in, um, your work is about commerce and that term. Uh, commerce, uh, as embraced by Hume, is is key. You know, civilizing uh, the sweet commerce of Montaigne. It, it seems even more because the way you presented it, and it's it's a very beautiful passages. He gives a special status to the merchant as a new figure. Uh, and this is important because it raises a somewhat different question, the relationship of commerce to class status. Uh, it raises a question of commerce to contract uh, and the kinds of contract trust confidence that people have with one another, the merchants in the process of trading and trucking and bartering. And that sort of left me as a puzzle uh, because in, in, the, in the work, what is the relationship to other figures who are capitalists, the monopolist, the East India Company with its charter, pirates, of course, the speculator, the hoarder, who were given a lot of attention uh, on, on the continent, I mean, in, in more physiocratic um, political economy. And so, so you know, that sort of the investment he has in the merchant and saying that the merchant now is this pivotal figure, a kind of idealized figure. In some ways, he became, this merchant figure became so vapid in you know his his his, or his and it's always a his that he almost became like a kind of cipher and I thought well maybe you know this is you you could work from there the do commerce could be uh, in economics following even on 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 Hume so abstract that he, he actually no longer exists okay he's such such a good natured civilizing and so on that if you don't bring in some sort of notions of outs, outside sociality uh, uh, of explanation that he almost ends up like this sort of optimality in a in a demand curve you know which works it's nice. And so, so I wanted you to comment some perhaps on this figure of the merchant. And, and then finally, uh, getting a, a question uh, that, that I had uh, that, that, you know, there was Emma Rothschild was the question of uh, commerce and war in, in some ways as it's the great danger. Uh, I was wondering, what is this notion of crisis? What is this notion of the exception? Uh, is it, is it, it's not as if this mid-century is without uh, crisis uh, in, 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 any, in any way. Uh, and, and as you, you mark it, you know, it's pretty much constant warfare. And so I was very interested in how uh, this economist of, philosopher of, of equilibrium, of sociality, uh, of this kind of optimism, which is almost 1990s, which has something of, gosh, of, of Thomas Friedman in, in it, and it, it's it sort of notion of, 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 of a world transcended by, by the sociality uh, of, of global contact. I, I was wondering, whether he theorizes it anyway, or whether, let's say not theorizing it, whether that element is there or whether that is simply uh, you know, off the question of the state of emergency, the question of crisis is simply off uh, of, his, of his agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Nat Turku. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you for writing the splendid book um, and uh, giving me an opportunity to engage with it and to think about Hume. Um, I'm going to uh, pull three sets of questions. Um, the first one is about what 
you know, Hirschman famously called the, the du commerce tradition. Um, uh, so the phrase is barred from Montesquieu as we know, but it's taken as a shorthand for a kind of providential belief almost that trade promoted um, or tended to promote um, peace and humanity. Um, one big question about Hirschman's argument is whether anyone in this period espoused that thesis in its unqualified form. So I wondered whether um, um, you view Hume as one of the um, thinkers who sing the loudest in the Du Commerce chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, as the book notes, right, the, the members of that choir uh, included Payne, Voltaire, others, um, but many others like, you know, Montesquieu and Smith tend to skip bars and lyrics, right? They don't go along with all of it. Um, and um, if indeed um, Hume's voice is the most prominent in carrying that song along, uh, then one reason for paying attention to his broader moral, political, and economic thinking, as this book does, uh, maybe for clues for explaining the wrong turns of Du Commerce thinking. Um, and if he is indeed, uh, so so I'll take one, you know, I'll, I'll take one um, example um, that the authors discuss in the book. So Hume's lifetime, of course, saw a lot of trade related conflict, um, including, you know, imperialism, um, the uh, Atlantic slave trade, so as, as trade expanded, it multiplied occasions for quarrel. Um, so the parlors of Paris and Edinburgh and London were indeed sparkling with refinement and toleration, but elsewhere in the world, um, uh, commercial society had, had rather barbaric implications. Um, and as the authors note, Hume himself was involved in the sugar business in Bristol, which we know to have involved um, indigenous dispossession, genocide and slave labor on, a, on, on an unprecedented gargantuan scale. Um, and although Hume personally deplored the slave trade and the institution of slavery, but the bracketing move I think is nevertheless noteworthy. Um, so Hirschman says that what um, finally burst this rosy du commerce bubble of optimism, and this was after all the age of bubbles, right, um, was uh, the Industrial Revolution bringing the violence of, um, uh, of, of trade competition back home. Uh, so, uh, you know, so seen from that lens, um, the du commerce thesis, I mean, if it, it indeed had any adherence, like a um, uh, full-throated adherence, seems to take a kind of what seems to me to be a great great deal of kind of willful ignorance um, or you know and or the discounting of non-european lives um, and uh, and many as we know many of the great writers of the 18th century did not partake in that willful ignorance so adam smith for example as the authors emphasize in the book was much more circumspect than hume about the effects of um, expanding markets and commerce um, on the world. So he, you know, for one thing, like Smith still paid homage to a kind of old fashioned virtue ethics, right? And he doesn't think that um, an unqualified consequentialist defense of the market, uh, of market society is appropriate either. And then Smith was in good company on this, as we know, Rousseau, Kant, Diderot, Alexander Hamilton shared um, uh, that circumspection um, towards market society. Um, so perhaps what, what we need to bear in mind is that Hume's ethical valorization of commercial society is still somewhat contrary and for his time. Um, of course, like that mindset, that that do commerce mindset is popular among the free thinking kind of bold salons of the time. Um, so not in that sense, but in general, this was still a quite conservative age that paid lip service at least um, to more or less kind of uh, uh, classical notions of virtue, you know, kind of Christian and, and, and civic. Um, that's why Mandeville is so scandalous, right? Because he goes through the list of these classical virtues and shows them up to be a charade. Um, so maybe the way to understand Hume's revaluation of values is an attempt at easing the anxieties mm. of a virtue-centered system um, uh, of, of social mores in the, in the face of the growing importance of the market sphere, which clearly relies right on the pursuit of self-interest um, uh, with an aim to wealth getting, which has been a disreputable activity since ancient Greece. Um, so 
what strikes us, um, I mean, what strikes me anyway, as a kind of glib and gratuitous extolling of bourgeois virtues um, is perhaps an earlier turn of the dialectic that, you know, for its time was a kind of liberation, at least the liberation from the dank, stultified, oppressive world of aristocratic mores. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe in his great rush to prove that the pursuit of self-interest need not bring about the collapse of ethical society, um, maybe Hume swung too far in the opposite direction. Hmm. Uh, my other two points are much more brief than that. Um, so my second question is, is something of a, of a, I think, I think something of a famous riddle. So when it comes to the philosopher economists, as you call them, which I think is a brilliant term that I shall use when I teach um, thinkers of, of um, uh, you know, uh, of this of the cert of this intellectual uh, circle or tradition. So, um, when it comes to the philosopher economists of the time, um, why uh, were the defenders of market society also? Why did they also um, tend to espouse a kind of moral sentimentalism in their philosophy, a kind of sentimentalism in their moral philosophy? Is there an internal kind of systemic link between defending the possibility of social integration on the basis of the pursuit of mutual self-interest on the one hand, and a moral ontology based on, you know, a sensibility, emotion, affect, et cetera, and sympathy, of course. Um, so for my part, I, I find the moral theory much more appealing than uh, the general kind of wealth of nations framework that's summed up by Hume's, you know, indissoluble chain formula, right? That unhindered trade would lead to industry and rising levels of affluence into a more humane society. Um, and I, I wonder like why that part of um, why, why the sort of um, sentimentalist moral philosophy seems to have, I think seems to have fallen out of favor or has at least been less successful than their economic teachings, which have attained, as you show, the status of kind of orthodoxy. Um, and my third question is about whether or the extent to which humans concerned with class conflict and specifically the kind that, you know, arises under capitalism. So just this, this, you know, what sort of, you know, so Smith certainly had, um, you know, there are famous passages in the Wealth of Nations where Smith acknowledges the interests of capital and labor frequently being at odds, that capital can exert its influence much more easily than labor. Um, much more prominently and to deleterious effect. Um, but Smith also thought that the expansion of capital would generate rising wages because there would be more demand for labor. And that idea, of course, seeds Marxist critique, as we know. Um, and, and then, you know, Rousseau um, identified the, the dynamics of class conflict. It was very prominent for him. He, you know, for in commercial society, he thought property was at the root of this. And Hume was also um, centrally concerned with property. He made it the central kind of preoccupation of justice, but without thinking too much about what justice might mean for those who have not. Rousseau did that. Uh, <laughs> You know, but his friend turned nemesis, you know, I think maybe frenemy um, doesn't doesn't seem to have. So my question is, you know, how seriously does Hume take class conflict, specifically conflict between labor and capital? Um, does he like Smith think it's a kind of ultimately a self equilibrating issue? And if he doesn't take it very seriously, um, I mean, what kind of an intellectual progenitor of capitalism neglects class conflict? And what does that say about the thousand ships that he has launched that are still floating around us today? Thank you. Thank you to our discussants, Emma Rothschild, Victoria de Grazia, Turku Ithixel, and we'll now hear from Margaret Chavis and Carl Wenerland in response to some of those points at least. Thanks. Um, shall I go first, Carl? Yeah. So I think it's important to keep in mind that in his treatise, and then again in the first inquiry, Hume uh, develops many arguments that deprive us of free will. There, arguably, there's nothing we do to change our nature. It's there and it's a flow through, if you want, of all prior conditions. And uh, yes, in the second inquiry, he revisits this and gives a little window of opening to the reform of one's character. But I think, and this is something that Carl brought up, Hume is very committed to the kind of material underpinnings, much as say Karl Marx will later on, to determine the, the cultural, institutional, and even behavioral traits of his time. 
And I think it's important to see that Hume himself is a part of his own age. And I think that's the one thing that links all of your comments, which I very much appreciate, that he is writing arguably before the Industrial Revolution really takes off. So he is attending to manufacturing as a central feature of his new economic world. And by the way, he dates the origins of capitalism to Henry VII to the early um, 16th century. And I think most historians would agree with that um, attribution. So he's got a, a pretty long window of 200, 250 years of looking at this rise of commerce. It's not something that just started in his own lifetime. And he thinks of it as really very mature. And I think, again, we might agree with that statement, but he's very much a product of that. He's a product of a period since the Glorious Revolution when he really thinks that Britain has taken on a new sensibility of enlightenment and progress and prosperity. And yes, there are wars with France and he, coming back to Emma's point, he calculates each war and we put it in the book, sorry, the Nine Years' War and the War of the Austrian Succession, each war he, he points to when it should have ended and it goes on for two, three extra years. So for him, politicians are always going to repeat this. They're always gonna prolong a war and of course, increase the bill and that will have to be paid off by future generations. But I think he's very much a product of his time. He's trying to make sense of the long durée and he's committed to evolutionary motifs. So he thinks of prior conditions unfolding epigenetically into new stages and that this is very important say in understanding the history of money or the history of commerce or the spread of capitalism globally because he does believe that each period will bootstrap the next and there will be this sort of migration of economic opportunity. He even argues that countries may never decline. Like Holland, he thinks, while it reached its height by the 1630s or 40s, is still doing very well as the provisioner of, uh, as brokers and traders to the world. And as each other region becomes more prosperous, even, Italy, which he saw as a very poor country at the time, they're gonna demand these Dutch services. So for him, there's this really, I think, important sense in which the whole world is on this trajectory. China is part of this. And he makes these sort of you know, wonderful gestures to where China might fit in or where America might fit in. And he looks in fact to North Africa and he looks to South America. So he's very interested in the entire global picture. Is he a, a European? Um, yes, and I mean, I think it's not by chance that Scotland is right now trying to reinforce its ties to Europe and swoop over its southern neighbor. You remember the phrase that, that is in the Mosner book that Hume referred to Londoners as those barbarians on the banks of the Thames, right? He had this wonderful, I mean, he had, a, he had suffered some anti-Scottish sentiment when he lived in, in London later in his life in his 50s. But I think that he had um, you know, this famous essay on national characters. He had a very contingent view of national character and national identity. And of course, hoped that we would transcend nationalism because of its um, tendency to encourage war. So I guess I'm gonna stop there. There's so much more that you three have raised and hopefully come back after Carl takes his turn. But I think to emphasize that Hume has some very penetrating insights into the, the actual scaffolding and internal mechanisms of capitalism. And it encompasses the whole globe, no question about that. It's an unfolding process. So he knows that new developments will happen in the future. But by the same token, he is kind of frozen in his period. And, and that I think is really important. It is a period beset with colonialism, slave trade, pre-industrial, um, modes of production for the most part. And I think that's um, all very important. Although again, Smith seems almost to take a step back by highlighting agrarian capitalism over that of manufacturing. There's certainly these tensions there between them. I'll turn it to Carl now. Thank you. Thank you so much for all those rich comments. I, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, obviously it would be impossible to do them all justice, but uh, let me, let me stop, uh, start with the last question and then try to weave myself through one of Vicky's questions and then one of Emma's questions. So the issue of class in Hume is absolutely essential to understanding him properly. 
he is a theorist of the emerging middle classes. It's primarily the merchants, but it can also be the financiers, the lawyers, the retailers, the improving landowners. He's theorizing a group of people, a class that's behaviorally defined and defined by their dedication to uh, upholding property, engaging in commerce and pursuing the arts and sciences. Um, so in his philosophical text, he universalizes this subject. So it appears as though it's humanity in general. But if you move to, for example, um, the, um, the history of England, there you see much more of the conflict and you see how this smooth story of how the conventions form property and, and, and how property becomes a form of justice, how the lower source, the peasants, the unemployed, how they are fighting against the system. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about the justified killing of thousands of people who oppose the enclosures. He talks about the um, the uh, usefulness, the utility of putting to people to death for counterfeiting the coin uh, and engaging in forgery that undermines the trust upon which the middle classes build their empire. Uh, he has, of course, the, the outrageous and despicable comments about people in the tropics, right? So, and uh, so, uh, uh, circling around to, to Emma's comments, he is very much thinking of himself, and I think Emma may have even said this in one of his essays, that he's theori theorizing his own kind, the, the class that he's a member of himself. And he sees himself more as part of a cosmopolitan middle class who are changing society in a particular way. So he's more wedded to behavioral issues as opposed to geographical issues. Right? He doesn't have much sympathy for the Laplanders. He doesn't have so much sympathy for the Scottish Highlanders. Uh, he doesn't have much sympathy for people in the East or the West or the South or the North. Uh, there's really a fairly small subsection of society that he sees as most capable of understanding philosophy and, and internalizing the kind of philosophy that he offers. And he also believes that they are the most capable of developing the kind of virtues that he believes a commercial society could be built on. So um, there is conflict, but you have to, you have to search for it. Um, essentially it's the state's role to uh, impose justice on these, on, on these people who are, um, who are challenging the commercial framework. And this comes back to, to Vicky's point about crises. Uh, I don't think war was a massive crisis for human. It was something to be avoided and it's something that could be avoided through trade and through the cultivation of this cosmopolitan middle class, right? Um, but I think the biggest crisis for him was instability, religious super, uh, uh, enthusiasm, uh, what he called uh, sort of irrational ideas and the, the, the people who challenge the very foundation of, these of this commercial society. So that to me, I think is, is the kind of crisis within that he was very concerned about. But he believed that the, the, the middle classes, um, that, that the middle class as a category was capacious and open, right? He thought similar to Adam Smith that the, aristoc the, the aristocratic classes would, would, would wither away uh, and that their power base in society would be undermined. But he didn't see any reason why the, 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 the lords and the greats could join the middle classes. And he even opened up a window or a door to the lower classes, embracing some of the behavioral features of the middle classes. And they too sort of could become part of this march of progress. And of course, it's a very quixotic vision of what commerce could do. I don't think Hume is suggesting that commerce had solved anything, but he thought the middle classes and the cosmopolitan world that they were creating, that there was a possibility in the future to move towards a more peaceful world, uh, but it required all of these mechanisms. In the book, we talk about his idea of the virtues of capitalism as being like a, 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 a pocket watch with all these complex mechanisms and features 
that had to run uh, in sync in order for the, all of these virtues and beneficial consequences to follow. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quixotic, it's, a, it's um, um, an aspirational philosophy. Um, it's uh, something that is looking towards the future to resolve some of the issues that he perceived to be challenges to peaceful sociability. And that included war. It included uh, uh, in the instability of the lower classes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carl and, and, and Margaret. I think I'll, I'll start by reading some, some of the questions to you and you can figure out who wants who's gonna answer which. So a first question is here, hang on, is that Hume advocated for a cosmopolitan approach that linked multiple countries together, yet explained that capitalism functioned best in a small republic. Can you explain how, how Hume reconciled the two? Uh, I'm just looking for that question, but I don't see it. But anyway, um, so he he certainly um, I think he equivocates on the republic monarch distinction. There's a part of him that thinks Britain has become more like a republic, and of course, I think he really likes representative government. He mentions democracy more than once. So there's part of Hume that um, hopes that either system could converge and and, and enhance the capacity for individual freedom and liberty and, and expression. So I think for him, those are probably the more important goals that he wants to achieve. Um, and in terms of the economy, I think for him, it's very important that there be a sphere of um, uh, activity so that people can undertake uh, new enterprises and innovate and invent. So he was very keen to harness what he called um, knowledge and curiosity, what Carl talked about, the arts and sciences, and see this um, really taking form in the production of novel goods and thereby, uh, again, spurring economic growth, which will ultimately, I think, for him, bring greater enlightenment. Um, a second question here is, you have chosen to speak of Hume's view of capitalism, a term that he did not use. Uh, why talk of capitalism rather than commercial society? Is this an editorial strategy to reach non-historians or a belief, a strong belief that 18th century commercial society shares many structural features with the late 19th and 20th century economic systems? Well, so it, it's, it, we, we went back and forth on, on whether to use commercial uh, society, whether to use economics or political economy. Um, and at the end, we just wanted to, um, to represent the origins of a societal system, societal uh, form that we saw and that Hume saw in a kind of nascent form at the time. Um, so it's, it's in part for convenience, it's part um, um, because we do, do see Hume theorizing the kind of structures of what would become capitalism. And he did so in a, in a very coherent and clear and cogent manner. So that, that was the choice. I'll just add one thing is that people have taken the 19th century name political economy and projected it back into the past. But when you look at the literature before 1750, the term political economy is almost never used. People talk about commerce far more frequently as the name of the discourse. So um, that was one of our reasons to, to shift to just using economics as a kind of blanket term for the whole period. Thank you. All right, another question here, <laughs> just a second. Uh, the East India Company was mentioned in passing. Could you say something about Hume's view of the company and whether it was a good thing for England, India, both or neither? I'll let Carl answer that. Okay. Uh, 
he, he doesn't offer a, a massive critique of, of monopolies. He doesn't offer a, a much by way of insights as to market what we would call market structure today, whether there's more or less uh, uh, free competition or oligopolies or, or, um, or, or monopolies. Um, he um, would, would, I mean, he, he did have some things to say about the kind of nature of the East India Company as uh, not just purely a commercial endeavor, um, and uh, given that it's also engaging in other types of, of, of enterprises, warlike enterprises, and we're very much interconnected with the imperial machinery of England. And given that he was opposed to that kind of colonialism, he was opposed to the subjugation of other people, instead wanted people to meet and engage through trade in a free and voluntary way. Um, he, you know, implicitly, this is a, a kind of corporate form that he would not have um, would not have seen as as the foundation of a of, of a of a commercial system that yielded a variety of moral, political, and social benefits. Well, Emma, you're muted. Yeah. No, I, I, I just wanted to um, add that, uh, that there's a very striking contrast between Hume and Smith on the, on the East India Company, because the a, a kind of biting critique of the East India Company is very, um, is very important indeed in the wealth of nations. Um, I, I think it's, this is partly explained simply by time. I mean, when, when Hume published the political discourses in 1752, the East India, the British and Dutch and French East India companies were really only getting going with their nefarious activities. And when Smith was writing The Wealth of Nations in the early 1770s, um, that every newspaper was full of the, of the horrors of, of famine and 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 um, plunder and, and 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 so on. That being said, both of them, um, from a point of view of sort of prosopography, had very intense connections to East India Company officials. Hume, rather more than Smith, so he was well aware of it. And I think this that the the tension between forms of government and long distance um, adventures. Um, are, are quite acute in this case, because Hume was certainly very critical of the defamations that followed from trying to govern at a great distance in the way that um, Britain and the East India Company were trying to govern in, in Bengal. Um, at the same time, he, he did have um, an, an idea of a sort of large political society. And this was what the, was picked up so effectively in, in the Federalist Papers, in the, the sort of arguments for competition between many small sects as being the basis for a sort of sustainable Republican form of government. And that I think Hume saw as being ruled out in the case of the East India Company. Um, and sorry, just to add one more thing. I mean, he, he had a very clear idea of, um, of uh, long distance commerce as extending not only to um, uh, Bengal, but way beyond that to China, as in the famous comment that um, if only um, China were nearer, everything we use would be Chinese. Yeah. I think it's also worth mentioning that he took part in 1746 of an invasion of Lorient in Brittany, which was the headquarters for the French East India Company. But uh, he certainly welcomed the capitalist financial um, initiatives that the joint stock companies represented in their early days. The fact that you could pool all these small holdings as it was always put of widows and orphans and make a company come into life. So I think there's a part of Hume that is and that goes back to the tensions that were mentioned early on in the panel that he had, I think, kind of a mixed regard for these joint stock companies. But yes, before, say, the Battle of Pontecherry, he didn't have the same um, um, picture of 
the, the uh, imperialist efforts of those companies. I have a, another question. Um, you've spoken at some length about the centrality of Hume's theorizing of the middle, middling sort and the sort of social model it provided for commercial society. At the same time, from your discussion, I'm gleaned that he overlooked the question of class conflict. In light of this, did Hume propose or foresee that the middling sort would grow to incorporate the lower classes or not? Yeah, so, so just, I'll just repeat what I said before. There, there's a, the, I don't think it will be fully subsumed, the lowering class amongst the middling class, but there certainly were openings um, and um, there was a possibility for, for farmers to become improving landowners for, um, um, for um, peddlers to become merchants, et cetera. So there's an, it's not a closed off class in that sense. Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with birth or title. It had much more to do with behavioral characteristics, as I said before. And just to add to that, Hume, in one of his rare moments, conjectures 500 years into the future, where he uh, believes that the aristocrats and the people who are manning the carriage, the servants will have switched places. So there's perhaps some long process. Well, and, but that's, of course, that's because of the national debt that will Maybe. upset things, that will turn things around. Well, that's sufficient uh, ground. It wasn't going away, that national debt. So I think he did think of the, there being potential for upward mobility. He talks about tradesmen in Glasgow and Edinburgh now uh, earning um, sufficient money per week to function with paper banknotes, 10 shilling notes. So there's a sense in which they're entering into that uh, world of money that was hitherto precluded from them. Um, another question here is, uh, I am curious about the author's understanding of Hume's views about international capital flows. Hume famously takes a liberal cosmopolitan non-mercantilist view of commercial trade, but in of public credit, seems to take a very worried view of capital flows, particularly in the form of public debt instruments and the growth of London as a financial center, the mobility of financial instruments and the threat these pose to old families in the landed class. So the question is about your understanding of international, his view of international capital flows. So, um, so in some ways he was very much in favor of wealth gravitating or, or uh, migrating from already wealthy areas to less wealthy areas to take advantage of lower labor costs. And he believed that that was a kind of engine of a favorable commercial globalization. When it comes to capital flows specifically pertaining to the national debt, he was quite concerned about it because he believed that um, much of the national debt were, was owned by foreigners and the tax receipts and the tax revenues that were um, imposed on the British population was thus exported to the uh, debt holders elsewhere. So that became a kind of net loss of, of, of wealth and liquidity for, for Britain. Thank you for that. I have a a question about an imaginary situation. If Hume could be brought back today and could immediately grasp our economic situation, what reactions might he have? This is an impossible question, but perhaps the authors have thoughts on what he might observe about our economic arrangements of today. Well, I, I mean, I, I haven't really thought about it because it is something of an injustice to Hume, but. I think he would be concerned at the um, fascination for gadgetry and the loss of equanimity and friendship and the cultivation of what he, you know, the poetry that say later John Stuart Mill put over Pushpin. We have far too much Pushpin and not enough poetry in our world. And I think he would also have worried that while yes, the world has prospered as he predicted, um, it hasn't necessarily induced um, greater justice in the sense of um, uh, distributive justice, particularly because I think he really did um, want to see the lower orders receive what he thought they were entitled to and have high wages. So I think his view is that there hasn't been the enhancement of the human spirit, its elevation, and um, by the same token, there hasn't been the 
kind of important redistributive outcomes that he would have envisioned taking place. Um, I think too that he would worry that the greed was still very rampant and that goes back to Turku's point about self-interest that I think Hume believed that self-interest could be in many ways um, contained and, and redirected. He talks about the fact that even though we might love ourselves more than any one person, our love for those around us definitely overrides our self-love. So there's a sense in which other regarding attitudes as Smith also um, proclaimed could become salient. And perhaps that is also something he would have worried did not take place with the 270 years since he put pen to paper. Let, let me just add one, one small. Uh, so, so Hume had a belief that government would become better once the middle classes populated government. Um, the refined merchants would turn to, to politics and would turn the world into a more just and safe and prosperous place. So I think if Hume uh, arrived uh, and saw what we just suffered through the last four years, uh, I think be quite um, um, quite appalled by the, the the lack of effect that the merchant lifestyle might have on certain people. Um, uh, just one or two more. Uh, would the authors like to comment on Hume's choice of literary form, the polite mode of the essay, as to po opposed to other more systematic approaches? Oh. <laughs> you want yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, Dan. Thank you very much for your question. Um, good to not see you. But uh, so uh, Hume wrote in essentially all the different literary genres, uh, and he was trying out different ways to get his message across. The history of England is very different from the essays. The essays are different from the inquiries, and the inquiries are different from the treaties. Um, some people suggest that he was. Um, um, distraught or, or um, unhappy with the effects and the reception of the treaties, and that he therefore sought to repackage his ideas um, in the inquiry so that he would reach a larger audience. Um, you know, he was not a wealthy man. He relied upon for his sustenance, his uh, publications. So in some ways he was um, commercially inclined and wanted to turn his, his scholarship and his writings into the necessary revenues for him to survive. But I think also more importantly is that he really wanted to have an effect in, especially with the essays, on the way that Britain and Europe was governed. He really wholeheartedly believed in his idea of a more peaceful, prosperous, and morally uh, righteous future. And he believed that these ideas, if they were adopted by people in power, many of which, many of whom he knew quite well, because he uh, operated within the halls of, of, of power as well, he really believed that, that that could have an effect and that it could actually lead to, um, to benefits. And for that purpose, um, he would use whatever literary genre that was most effective and much uh, and, and most um, most useful to to that end. And uh, uh, one last question: Did Hume comment at all about rising tensions with the American colonies? Um, yes, he did. He certainly, you know, there's a famous paper that he was an American um, from the start. He was friends with Benjamin Franklin, but he also welcomed. Um, by 1773, he thought that Britain should just relinquish its uh, colonial ties and let America uh, become its own republic. And uh, he did agree that the tax system was punitive. Um, so he had a lot to say and um, there's good reason to see, and this was mentioned by Emma, that his ideas live on in the Federalist Papers and, and in the work of Hamilton and so on, so that his legacy in the United States is really quite important. Emma, and then I have one more question. <laughs> yeah. You're on mute. mute. You're muted, Emma. On, on a note of what might have been, one of the many places Hume decided he wanted to emigrate to was actually Boston. And the, the famous expedition against the French East India Company port in, in Lorient happened 
because he'd been becalmed for several weeks when he thought he was crossing the Atlantic to, to raise a company in Boston and settle there forever. But the winds were against him, as was so often the case then. And finally, he and his, his uh, shipmates were redirected to, um, to, to the coast of France. So, so think what the American Revolution would have been like if they'd had David Hume here from the 1740s. <laughs> Uh, uh, another question. Someone in the audience was struck by the claim that Hume was argued with as an economist. Does that underrate his reputation as a great skeptic to be refuted or demolished? And here I think of the impact on Kant and on the so Scottish common sense philosophers and his notoriety with respect to religion. Hume was argued with as an economist. I'm not sure what that means, but... Victoria said that in her comments. No, I'm afraid I said that. Okay, sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. And and hello, Philip. Nice to nice <laughs> to see you. Um, I, I it this was the case until maybe around the 1840s, and it was very much complementary to the point about him being seen as a as a skeptic. It I, I think it was so dangerous to be um, thought of as a skeptic from the 1790s to the 1840s in, in British public discourse that people really avoided the whole question of, of Hume's, um, Hume's philosophical writings. And, and it was the easier thing to do to focus on him as a historian and as a kind of um, um, eulogist of of, 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 of commerce. And you know, I, I think this changed beginning with mid, with sort of Victorian philosophers, including F.D. Morris and other Christian philosophers who, who suddenly discovered that Hume and indeed later Smith were great philosophers. So, so this, is a, this was a comment on, the, on the, the early period of the Hume reception. But just to jump in there, I mean, one of the things we show in chapter seven is that everybody read Hume's economics very carefully. So he leaves his imprint, not just, of course, on his good friend, Adam Smith, but on Canet, Turgot, on um, Stuart, on um, Ricardo. Ricardo read a lot of Hume early in his stages of his uh, work and money. Um, Marx, all of the figures that you know of the 19th century, um, they may not sort of broadcast their appreciation of Hume, but we have found that there is this longer legacy um, and therefore an imprint on um, economics of the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, of course, people like Hayek and Keynes very much uh, resuscitate Hume, uh, particularly again, um, his, his broad understanding of economic relations. Mm -hmm. I, a last question here, a remark and a question. It seems paradoxical that the human legacy in later 20th century economics was arguably one of legitimating the latter's hyper-mathematization, anti-philosophy sentiment, and failure to attend to culture. This probably is, ex is explainable by a complicated story about Hume's historical appropriation by early 20th century positivism. Recent scholarship, such as in the book under discussion, is starting to erode that interpretation of Hume. Uh, the, the interpretation of Hume that led to that appropriation. Related to this, it is fascinating that Hume had deep reservations, at least initially, about Newtonians, Newtonianism, according to the book. The question then is, what led to this long-standing misinterpretation? You want to take that, Margaret? <laughs> well, you know, history plays tricks upon the dead, said Voltaire. I, I mean, I do think there is a pretty good uh, amount of evidence that Hume, as Emma pointed out, was not really appreciated as a philosopher for much of the 19th century. And that, I, I mean, I think it's important to see that he comes into his own, of course, with positivism, um, but also because of his imprint on Darwin and Einstein, the, the kind of strong empiricism that both um, end up bringing to the foreground in the 20, 20th century. Um, of philosophy writ large, you know, it's natural philosophy, I think it's very important. So I think Hume's reputation really um, develops because of all of those 
um, tugs. And um, I, I mean, I think he's still on an upward trajectory. I think that he may be in, in bad repute with um, some fields in history and cultural studies, but in philosophy, the adjective humian is used, I, it, it just is used more frequently with every decade. So it's almost as though philosophers are becoming humians. Carl, did you have any last comment on that one? No, that's good. So with that, I just want to say that I want to make sure that everybody checks out the link to the book, which is in the chat. I want to thank our discussants, and I want to thank our authors, and I want to thank our audience for attending today. Bye. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.